in a regular course on physical science, we're taught about electrons, protons, and all that kind of stuff. But really rarely are we actually taught about the history behind these things. How do we know these particles exist in the first place? And that's something that I wish we actually covered a lot more in primary education. And that's for three reasons. The first is that it gives some sort of story to the engineering and science knowledge that you're learning, which for me at least makes it a lot easier to remember what's going on. Two, it gives some insight into the process of discovery. Learning how the great scientists thought about these things and debated tells us a lot about critical thinking. And third, it reinforces the habit of knowing why you know the things that you know. In this digital age with so much information and misinformation out there, it's more important than ever to develop this skill. If you don't understand why you know something, how can you ever know when you're wrong? So in this video, which I'd like to make part of about a three-part video series, I'd like to cover a brief history of all of the particles that make up the standard model of particle physics. Now this topic is way too broad to cover in a single video or even in a short video series, so I'm not going to make this complete in any sense. However, I do hope to give sort of the flavor of how each of the particles were discovered and maybe talk about the sort of discussions that were going on in the scientific community at the time. With that, let's get to it. Nearing the turn of the 20th century, the debate on whether all matter was made of particles had still not been completely settled. While the view was starting to gain some scientific consensus, some prominent scientists and philosophers still doubted that all matter was made of particles. For instance, Nobel Prize winning big shot chemist Wilhelm Oswald said in 1896, We read in here with countless repetition the statement that the only intelligent explanation of the physical world is to be found in a mechanics of the atom. I here propose to state my conviction that this so generally accepted view is untenable. However, many prominent scientists have been working on the atomic theory from well before the modern era. These include names such as Democritus, Newton, Avogadro, and especially John Dalton, among many, many others. However, by the late 1800s, the evidence for atoms was very strong. Statistical mechanics had been developed by Maxwell, Boltzmann, Gibbs, and others, which explained the science of thermodynamics in terms of the motion of tiny particles, with kinetic gas theory being their crown jewel. Then, in 1905, Einstein published a paper that explained Brownian motion, the seemingly random motion of dust particles suspended in liquids. He described the motion as the effect of little water molecules bouncing off of the dust, and he derived statistical relationships that would need to hold if this were the true cause. Later experiments performed by Jean-Baptiste Perrin in 1908 validated Einstein's theory. Funnily enough, it was Perrin's validation of Einstein that finally convinced Wilhelm Oswald that atoms exist. This set the stage for the following century, where the particle theory of matter would grow wildly rich and successful. The culmination of these years led to what is now called the standard model, or sometimes the best tested theory in science. J.J. Thomson is credited with finding the very first elementary particle, the electron. Thomson was studying cathode rays, now known to be streams of electrons. By connecting a very strong battery to two pieces of metal embedded in a glass tube, a very basic particle collider called a cathode ray tube can be made. The collider works like this. A glass tube is partially evacuated, meaning some atmosphere still lingers, but not so much that it would block almost any electron that's traveling from one side to the other. When a positively charged and negatively charged plate are introduced, positive ions that are always present in the atmosphere get pulled towards the negatively charged metal plate and slam into it. When they strike it, electrons are then thrown from their atoms in the metal. With that interatomic bond broken, the electrons are then free to be immediately repelled by the rest of the negative charges that have built up on the plate. These electrons then fly towards the positively charged metal though their large momentum means they typically shoot right past it and end up hitting the glass tube, which itself contains electrons. The interaction of those free electrons with the electrons in the glass tube creates visible light. Thompson experimented with applying an electric field to the cathode rays. In earlier years, chemist William Crookes, who coincidentally had also invented this kind of cathode ray tube, determined that the rays would bend under the influence of magnetic fields. To him and many other physicists, this immediately implied that the rays were actually made of beams of particles 
as opposed to some sort of aether phenomenon, which was the competing theory at the time. However, because the electrons are so light, they seem to defy gravity, and early experiments in low vacuum suggested that their motion was not affected at all by an electric field. Hendrik A. Lorentz had previously derived the effect of electric and magnetic fields on charged particles, and it suggested that any moving charged particle should be affected by both electric and magnetic fields. Thompson repeated experiments in higher vacuum, and he was able to show that the rays were actually deflected by electric fields. And further, he was able to deduce the charge to mass ratio for electrons, and then compared it to known values for ionic gases. Thompson found that the electron had a charge to mass ratio, which was strikingly larger than any other ionic gas, three orders of magnitude larger than hydrogen ions, the lightest known particle at the time. Because the charge to mass ratio was so large, Thompson knew that he had either found an extremely highly charged particle or an extremely light charged particle. Further experiments would show that it was the latter, but in either case, he knew that he had found something new. And for that, he was given the Nobel Prize in 1906. Thompson's student, Ernest Rutherford, continued the particle discovery by finding evidence of the atomic nucleus, and later the proton. Rutherford's collaborators, Geiger and Marston, famously shot hydrogen nuclei, also called alpha particles, at a thin sheet of gold. They created a sort of alpha particle gun by wrapping a radioactive source of alpha particles inside of a lead container with a tiny hole. At a short distance away, another lead slab was hung, which also had a very tiny hole, ensuring that alpha particles which made it through both holes were traveling in a straight line. A very thin sheet of gold foil was placed at the center of a ring of detectors called scintillators. Scintillators are a very special material that emit light when a charged particle passes through them. Marston sat in a dark room with this apparatus and counted which pieces of scintillator lit up. What he found left him and Rutherford very confused. J.J. Thompson has suggested that materials were made up of a sort of soup of charged particles. This was called the plum pudding model. And that was the prevailing theory at the time. Rutherford and his team had expected this experiment to show that the alpha particles would all pass right through the gold, or maybe there would be some minor deflections. However, what Marston saw was that a small number of the particles were actually deflected back, more than 90 degrees, sometimes straight back towards the gun. Rutherford was quoted as saying, It was as if you fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper, and it came right back and hit you. Ultimately, Rutherford deduced that this implied that the gold was made of a lumpy collection of heavy particles, heavy at least compared to the alpha particles, rather than a continuous material. With that, he suggested the basic solar system style model of atoms that we still use to this day as a first order approximation. And that was the discovery of the nucleus. The story of the photon deserves a video all on its own because in addition to being the discovery of an elementary particle, it was actually also the birth of quantum mechanics. Normally, the story starts with black body radiation. Because of the thermal motion of particles and matter, any object at non-zero temperature will randomly emit some light. This light is called black body radiation, and it's why you see a red glow on your electric stovetop. Here in this animation, we zoom into a piece of gold, and we see the little atoms bouncing around and shooting off the light. That light is black body radiation. Black body radiation under equilibrium was studied extensively in the 19th century, and it was shown by Kirchhoff that the amount of light radiated at each color depends only on the temperature of the body and not the material. Despite great progress in the 19th century, an open problem remained for about 40 years, and that was how to describe the amount of energy emitted at each frequency for a particular temperature. It would take Max Planck in about the 1900s to come up with a solution, and he would have to make a pretty crazy mathematical leap in order to do so. A few months prior to Planck's discovery, Lord Rayleigh had also attempted to derive the energy distribution using techniques from statistical physics. His result was the following curve. Here, B is the amount of energy emitted at a particular wavelength, lambda, and temperature, T. We can see the dependence goes as T over lambda to the fourth. Though it wasn't known to Raleigh at the time, I've also drawn in the true curve found in nature, 
As can be seen, at very large wavelengths, the two curves agree. However, at short wavelengths, Rayleigh's predicted energy goes to infinity, which is clearly not physical. If Rayleigh's function was the true answer, that would mean that any common oven contains infinite energy, which is an absolute absurdity. To get around this, Rayleigh suggested that his law must only be valid for large wavelengths. Eventually, this result would be called the ultraviolet catastrophe, marking the catastrophic failure of classical physics in the high-energy part of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, the short wavelengths, a different distribution seemed to fit the data. This was discovered by Wine a few years earlier in 1896, and had an exponentially decaying form. Again, Wine's law was known to fail for long wavelengths. When Planck was made aware of these results, he set out to find a way to interpolate between the two solutions that work on either end of the spectrum. Very roughly, Planck imagined that the material was made of an infinity of little springs, each spring having its own stiffness, and every possible stiffness is represented in the total collection. When a light wave crashes into the black body, the little springs begin to jiggle. Planck went on to suggest a quite odd and ad hoc addition to this picture. He suggested that perhaps the springs could only oscillate with very specific energies. These energies were multiples of the spring's natural frequency f, with a proportionality constant that turns a frequency into an energy. He called this h. In this way, Planck was able to turn the equation for the amount of energy in each group of wall springs from this integral, which gives an average energy that does not depend on the wavelength, causing the total energy to be infinite due to the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, into this sum. The sum is an example of a geometric series, which Planck knew well. By adding up the terms, you get an average energy that dies off exponentially with frequency. This exponential decay controls the infinity and causes the average energy to match observation. And if all of this seems a little bit odd to you, you're actually in really good company because Planck himself later said that this derivation was an act of desperation in order to achieve a positive result. And regardless of all of that, Planck's solution seemed to work. It matched Wine's solution in the high frequency space and Raleigh's solution in the low frequency space and seemed to match the data perfectly well, even though it had this kind of weird mathematical oddity in it. About five years later, Einstein would come in and clear the picture up. In one of his three groundbreaking 1905 papers, Einstein points out that the continuous fields described in Maxwell's equations may be a statistical illusion. He suggests that perhaps the emission and absorption of radiation is done in discrete packets, i.e. as a particle, and our wave picture of light are just statements about bulk averages of the motions of those particles. Einstein showed how thinking of light as a particle solved three open problems all of them having to do with why increasing the amount of light in some experiment could not overcome certain energy barriers. The first is known as Stokes' rule. It's that light cannot be transformed into light of a higher frequency. One might assume that a lot of low energy light might be able to be transformed into a little bit of high energy light. However, this was not observed. If light is always absorbed and emitted as a single particle, then it's clear that more particles aren't going to change the energy properties of a particular absorption and admission process. The second, most widely remembered, is the photoelectric effect. When light is shined on a piece of metal, some electrons are generated, which have a varying amount of kinetic energy. If you only consider the wave nature of light, you might assume that the more light you shine on the metal, the faster moving electrons you'll get flying off. In other words, bigger waves hit the shoreline harder and should cause more damage. This is, however, not the case. More light does create more electrons, but brighter light does not change how much energy each electron has. That is only affected by the color of light. Einstein again explained how this perfectly makes sense if the absorption and emission process is done discreetly. Since each electron is liberated by one particular piece of light, with only so much energy, that's determined by its color, more light will not increase the energy of the liberated electrons. The final observation was about the ionization of gas, where Einstein suggested a limit to how many grams of gas are ionized by light, which also seemed to be congruent with all known measurements.
While today, in retrospect, we often call Einstein's 1905 paper the discovery of the photon, at the time, the physics community did, did not readily accept this idea. For instance, in 1913, when Max Planck was recommending Einstein to be uh, given a position at the Prussian Academy of Sciences in Berlin, he felt the need to sort of apologize for Einstein's photon hypothesis by saying that sometimes, as for instance in his hypothesis on the light quanta, he may have gone overboard and his speculations should not be held against him. Of course, over those 20 years, Einstein would ultimately be proven correct. He continued to work on his photon hypothesis in 1909 showing that the momentum of a photon would have to be hf over c. His predictions about the photoelectric effect were ultimately experimentally verified in 1915, and the final blow to the wave-only nature of light came with Arthur Compton in 1923. Compton showed that shooting light at a free electron caused the light to deflect and change direction in perfect accordance with a particle nature. This showed that light not only transferred energy like a particle, but it transferred momentum like a particle. This was enough to convince Einstein himself, who had so far been somewhat reluctant to push his particle picture with full confidence, as well as the majority of other non-believers. And of course, these were the days when a new particle came with a new Nobel Prize, which Einstein won in 1921 for exactly this work on the photoelectric effect. So thank you guys so much for watching this video, the first in the series of elementary particles and their discovery. In the next part, we're going to talk about the neutron, the pions, the positron, and the neutrinos. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you learned something useful. Mm -hmm.